Very few. Uh, oh, just before I get started, um, the Google shared spreadsheet that I sent yesterday, if you can, um, many of you got, I mean, almost all of the DCFs I got, I've returned back. So if you have a DCF value, just go to Google shared spreadsheet, enter the DCF value and the price. And then if you're, if you're done with the pricing, enter that too. So basically it's just a summary of what you want to find on your project. And you don't have to wait to the very last day to do it. So whenever you feel ready, if you can enter those numbers, it'll be a great deal of help because um, I used that in my very last session and you will see what I mean by, by using that. So help me to see what you're finding on your companies, you know, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to feed you back what you collectively found as a class. And I've done this every semester I've taught this class. I'll show you what percentage of stocks came out as undervalued, overvalued, buy sells, and you can, you can compare yourself to the last semester, two years ago, three years ago. So it'll be an interesting experiment to see what you guys find. So when, whenever you get a chance. Darshan? <clears throat> um, yeah, so my company just came up with the results. Should I bother updating the numbers now? <laughs> it's a loaded <laughs> question, right? I wouldn't update all the numbers. Basically, is it a full 10K? Is it a quarterly report? What is it? Quarterly. Yeah. So basically, the two numbers that change the most are revenues and operating income, right? So. If it's a crisis, come. If it, what? What are you do? Who are you doing again? I forgot. Tesla. Tesla. Tesla is tricky, right? Because every quarter it brings out. <laughs> um, you don't have to. I mean, I think it's, we're close enough to the end that I'm going to cut you some slack. But I, I would just look at the numbers to see if there are any surprises. Because if there are surprises, you might want to bring it in. I don't think this particular report is as surprising as a typical Tesla report. So it's. Um, I think it's going to be in line. So unless your story changes significantly because of the report, let me put it that way. I would leave it untouched. Did your story change significantly? Uh, uh, no. Okay, no, then, leave it, then leave it alone. Right, your value is not going to change. You can go tweak the revenues, tweak the tweak. Ultimately, value, <clears throat> value comes from your end story. And if that's not changing. And that's why, you know, I think people overdo reports. They think about the big effect on earnings per share. I really don't care. If my story doesn't change, my value won't change. Okay, folks, it's time and I'm going to get started. So we're going to go through a fair amount today because in a sense, the last class was boring. It was in, you know, it was a lot of layers of stuff that you probably didn't want to deal with. But if you do the basics of understanding what an option is and what drives option pricing, we're going to have some fun with that structure. So before I get started, any questions in the option pricing part, the mechanics of options? Sergio? Oh, uh, oh your mic is just... Yeah, go ahead. In terms of the, the, the big difference of, of the European versus the American uh -huh. uh, option types, could you tell us a, a little bit intuitively if, if there is anything that you can easily manipulate to, to go from one to the other, or just generally say, like, it's a little bit on the price. Yeah. The European option value will give you a base value, right? An American option can never sell for less or be valued less than a European option with exactly the same characteristics. So that part you get, right? So, so if you compare European to American, because in an American option, you get everything you get in a European option, plus you get this chance to exercise early. An American option should never trade for less than a European option. The question is how much of a premium? The premium depends on whether there's a value to exercising early. That's why I said for listed options on stocks like the CBOE options, you can get away using a European option pricing model because nobody exercises early. You're going to sell the, the option to somebody else. So the optionality you get in the American option is worth very little. With real options, there's potentially more value from early exercise. How much more? In my, I, I'll give you my gut feeling, probably five to 10%. And I'd much rather get a conservative estimate by using the European option pricing model and take that as my base, than overreach and try to use a binomial model and screw up on the inputs. Question? Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead, Kina. Could we, could we do a quick recap on the application of Black Scholes, the the question that I had was the the formula to find the value of the option or the call premium is yeah. 
is basically six discrete variables. Yeah. Two of them probabilistic. One, the share price, the strike price, the risk free, and time. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And, and then. Then when you add dividends, you can add the dividend component. So the dividend adjusted version of the Black Scrolls, you throw the dividends in as well. Right. Okay. So traditional Black Scrolls, there are five variables. So w when you say application, what are you talking about? Are you talking about how you come up with the number in the Black Scrolls? Just how to use it. Okay. I so just wanted to make sure I understood the variables. And I, okay. and I know the ND1 and ND2, it's not necessarily hugely important to... No, 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 wait, wait, wait. The, the variables you estimate are SKR, T, and Sigma. The ND1 and ND2 are computed within the model. So let's start with the variables you estimate. You need a start value for the underlying asset. That's the S. You need a strike mm -hmm. price. You need a life for the option. You need a riskless rate. And you need a variance in value of the underlying asset. So those are your five inputs. Everything else is computed. So is your question about how to get the inputs or how to go from the inputs to the value? Okay, so, so ND1 and ND2 will be computed. Exactly. Okay. But to get, so basically okay. here's what happens. You feed in D1, these inputs. Those inputs give you D1 and D2 because we look at the inputs go into that equation. It looks a little messy, but it's a mathematical equation. You plug the numbers and you get D1 and D2. Once you get D1 and D2, you go to the normal distribution, you look up N of D1 and N of D2, so it's all happening within the model, right? And then you just plug it back in. So the application of the Black-Scholes is just taking those five inputs and converting them first into D1 and D2, going from D1 and D2, N of D1 and N of D2, and going from there to the value of the call. Okay, got it. So if you have S, K, R, and T, first you feed it into... Uh, the D1 equation to exactly. find ND1 and ND2, and then you can find the value of the option. Exactly. That's exactly the sequence. And, yeah. and without getting too deep into the math, ND1 is like a, a contingent probability. Exactly. Like the likelihood and the magnitude of the game, and ND2 is just a probability of expiring in the money. Exactly. You know? Exactly. That's exactly it. Okay. Yeah. The, the, so the ND2 is the one that people focus on when they talk about properties. The ND1 is kind of a wanderer that comes into the room. You kind of pay attention to it only in, out of the, the side of your eyes. But ND2 is the key number. Okay. And, and ND1 has a relationship with like theta and gamma, which are kind of... They're like all interrelated, the right? Because in a sense, you can see all of those numbers, D, the delta, the theta, the gamma, they're all going to be interrelated because when you change one, you change everything else, right? right. Because D1 and D2 change, and when D1 and D2 change, N of D1 and N of D2 change. So when you talk, when, when option traders talk about thetas, gammas, they're holding everything else constant and changing only one variable. Got it. Yeah. Okay. When, uh, another question, sorry. Yep. When you when you are thinking about the variance in the asset, is if it, it's let's say stop or something, like mm -hmm. that, you run into the same issue you had before with betas or something like that. Of you are counting on the past. Hey, you know what? That's that's an that, yeah, that's an open question. The variance you really should be using is the variance in the future, right? The problem is none of us knows what that variance is. So a lot of option traders just use the variance in past prices. But remember with betas, we argued that that might not be always the best way. So you know what? I'm an agnostic on this one. I'm willing to use the variance from the past on your own stock. I'm willing to use a bottom-up variance by looking at the variance in the sector. So I think that you have to lay open the possibility that you want the best estimate for the future. If that turns out to be past variance, use it. If not, use an industry average. I'm absolutely okay with using industry averages. So let's lay out the three questions we're going to address. So every real option I'm going to introduce, I'm going to ask three questions. Is there an option? For that, I'm going to look for a contingent payoff and an underlying asset. Is there exclusivity? Because that's what drives the value. And can I use an option pricing model? And to answer the third question, I'm going to see whether the asset is traded, the option is traded, and whether I can see what the option pricing model delivers. So here's the first set of options I want to talk about. In traditional corporate finance, and if you've taken corporate finance with me or with anybody else, this is what you're taught to do. When you look at a project, you're supposed to project the cash flows in the project, come up with a discount rate, come up with the present value, and compute a net present value. And if the net present value is positive, you take the project. If it's negative, you reject the project. That's good advice. 
But sometimes that analysis can lead you to do some silly things. And here's why. Let's assume you have a project that right now is a negative net present value. So we all agree you shouldn't take the project. But I give you the exclusive rights to this project for the next 10 years and ask you how much would you pay for those rights? What's your first reaction? It's a negative net present value project. It's a bad project. Why would I pay for the rights to a bad project? Why might you pay the, for the rights to a bad project? What do you hope will happen? The net present value is negative now, but it doesn't stay negative forever, right? So you could have the cash flows change, the investment change, the technology change. So first we're going to talk about the option to delay a project. And we're going to argue that just because you have a negative net present value project or a non-viable technology, don't jump to the conclusion that the rights to that project or technology are not worth money. So we're going to talk about the option to delay. Here's the second option. Let's suppose you have a negative net present value project. Let's give the project an example. So let's suppose you're Marriott, you're thinking about opening 10 hotels in China and your net present value says it's negative. Now part of you says reject the project, but then you say if we open these hotels and they do well and we learn about the Chinese market and it turns out to be a lucrative market, that first project can give me a right to a second project, a project to expand into the rest of China. And that second project can have so much value as an option that I'm willing to overlook the negative net present value on the first project. I know I said a lot there, but what I'm doing is I'm linking two projects. The first project is a negative net present value, but that project gives you a right to another project which is much bigger and is a positive net present value. You're willing to take the bad project to get the rights to a potentially huge project. That's called the option to expand. That is the real option that excites people because I've given you a license to do really stupid things, right? Take investments that lose money, buy technologies where you know you're not going to make money because it might give you a chance to do something in the future that is essentially incredibly valuable. When people talk about strategic investments, if they really mean what they say, they're talking about the option to expect. The third option I want to talk about is the option to walk away from your mistakes. When you take a long-term project, sometimes very early in the project, you will realize that this was a mistake. You shouldn't have done this. If you can walk away from that bad project, that is an incredibly valuable option to have. That's called the option to abandon. The option to delay, the option to expand, the option to abandon. And all of these options are options that might let you take a negative net present value, override the negative net present value, and take the project anyway. So let's start with the option to delay. Traditional capital budgeting, net present value is negative, don't take the project. But let's say you have the rights to this project for the next 10 years. Remember what I said, the best way to recognize a project is to draw the payoff diagram. So I'm going to draw the payoff diagram for the option to delay. And here's what it looks like. Remember, you have the right to take this project. If you do take the project, the initial investment you will need to make on the project becomes the equivalent of the strike price. The present value of the cash flows from taking the project will become the equivalent of the S. Right now, the project has a negative net present value, but what you're hoping for is sometime over the life of your, so let's say you have the rights for the next 10 years, sometime over the next 10 years, the present value of the cash flows will exceed the initial investment. You will take the project because it is a positive net present value. So you pay for the rights of this project for the next 10 years. Is it possible you could be disappointed? Absolutely. And if so, what do you lose? You lose what you paid up front to get the exclusive rights to the project. That is the option to delay. The underlying project becomes the underlying asset. The strike price is the initial investment you need to make. And the life of the project is however many years you get the rights to take on this project. So I'm going to use the option to delay in two settings. The first is to value a patent as an option. And second, I'm going to use it to value undeveloped reserves at a natural resource company as an option. Let's start with a patent. Think of what you get with a product patent. You get the rights, the exclusive rights to convert this patent into a commercial product any time over the life of the patent. In, the, in US patent law, I think it runs somewhere between 17 and 20 years. So when I give you the patent for the next 17 years, I don't require you to convert the patent to a product. You have the right to convert the patent into a product. At the risk of sounding abstract, let's assume that the cost of developing this patent into a product today is up. What, I'm, what I mean by that 
is when you decide to convert the patent into a product, you've got to spend money building a factory, getting ready to make that patent into a commercial product. Let's call that I. Let's assume V is the present value of the cash flows you would get if you develop the patents today. So I'm not asking a hypothetical about the future. I'm saying if you develop the patent today, what would the present value of the cash flows be? Let's call that V. If V is greater than I, you could develop the patent today and you'd make V minus I, the net present value. If V is less than I, remember right now you haven't decided to develop the patent, you're going to sit on the patent and hope it turns into a productive patent. So here's what it looks like on a payoff diagram. The cost of converting the patent into a product becomes the equivalent of the strike price. The underlying asset is the product that emerges from the patent. The present value of the cash flows on that product become the equivalent of S. And of course, you could end up with a patent that ends up becoming not viable over its entire life. In which case, what, did, what are you losing? How did you get the patent in the first place? What is the, I mean, what, how do most companies get patents? What are the two ways you can get patents? Anybody? Okay, Juliana, how do you get patents? Well, um, how do you just register them? Oh, sorry, your, your mic was open. I thought you were asking a question. Darshan? R&D expenses are one, one way you get patents. What do you spend on R&D? In fact, you can think of R&D as the price you pay to buy these options. Already, there's an interesting side story that comes out of this. Remember what, what happens to the value of options as you're more uncertainty? Options are more valuable when the uncertainty is greatest. So if you buy into that notion, if you think of R&D as the cost of acquiring options, you know what that's going to lead you to? You should do the most R&D in businesses or areas where there's a lot of uncertainty and less R&D in areas where there's, there's more certainty. We'll come back and talk about this more, but R&D is one way you get these patents. The other is you actually buy a patent. So the cost of the patent becomes what you lose if the value never picks up. And of course, if the value picks up, you develop the patent. And this is what I meant about European and American options. Let's say you have 17 years left on the patent. If you treat it as a European option, you know when you'll develop the patent, even if it becomes viable? You'll wait till the last day of the 17th year. That makes no sense, right? You want to develop the patent while you still have protection. So we're going to talk about how to adapt the Black-Scholes model to reflect it. But basically, the cost of product introduction is a strike price. The, the product becomes the equivalent of the underlying asset. Any questions on that payoff diagram? So let's see how we'd actually get the numbers to value this patent as an option. So here's how I get the inputs. The underlying asset is the product that comes from the patent. To get that number, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the present value of the cash flows if I develop the patent today. I'm going to ask you to do a traditional capital budgeting, project the cash flows, discount back at the cost of capital, everything we've taught in traditional capital budgeting. What do you get as a present value of the cash flows? Not the net present value. Don't bring out the initial investment. Just the present value of the cash flows becomes the S in the model, the value of the underlying asset. For the variance in that value, it's going to be tricky. You can't look this up on Bloomberg. It's a project. You've got a present value. There are two ways you can get a variance. One is you can cheat and say, I'm a biotechnology company. This is a biotechnology project. Therefore, I'm going to use the variance in stock prices of biotech companies. You're making a leap of faith, but it's easy enough to get. Alternatively, if you remember, we did Monte Carlo simulations. If you do Monte Carlo simulations, the variance in present values that you get from a simulation can become the variance you use in the model. So you've got the value of the underlying asset, you've got the variance in that value. Now to, to fill out the rest of the details, the exercise price becomes the amount you've got to spend, the initial investment you'll have to make to convert the patent into a product. So that'll become the K. The expiration of the option is whenever the patent expires. But here's where I'm going to add a twist. If I left it there, you will never develop this patent because you will basically hold on to the patent to the very end of the last day. So here's what I've got to do. I've got to introduce what I'm going to call a cost of delay. What is this? Once your op patent becomes viable, part of you would say, let's wait a year. We can collect more information. Maybe I'll learn more and the project will become better. But I've got to say, look, if you wait a year, here's what you give up. You give up one out of the remaining years you have of protection against competition. So you have 10 more years 
of protection left and you decide to wait a year and it's a viable patent, you've given up one out of those 10 years of protection. I'm going to make a simplistic assumption. That means you give up one tenth of your cash flows. If you're willing to actually estimate how much cash flows you're going to lose by waiting, I'll let you use that instead. But this takes on the role of the dividend deal in the model because in a dividend deal, basically what you have is by waiting to exercise the option, what you give up is what happens to the X dividend date, this drop in the price. So cost of delay becomes like a dividend yield. So I'm going to use the dividend yield adjusted version of the black shoals with the cost of delay working as the dividend yield. So S is the present value of the cash flows. The sigma in that S is, will be coming from a Monte Carlo simulation by looking at publicly traded stocks in that business. The strike price is the initial investment and the life of the option is going to be whatever years I've left on the patent. So I'm going to use this on an, on an example. One of the problems with trying to value patents is many of the inputs you need to value this patent is internal information, information that the pharmaceutical company might have or a technology company might have, but you can't observe from the outside. So the example, yeah, go ahead. I think the math of this is probably beyond me, but my impression from last session was that the dividend yield variable helps to account for like the stochastic randomness that occurs throughout time of a share no, price. No, 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 that's not, the dividend yield variable is there to capture the fact, not that the stochastic, it's got nothing to do with variability. The dividend yield is there because of the fact that when dividends get paid, your stock price drops. So right. in a traditional option, the dividend yield captures the fact that if you wait, your stock price will drop by the dividend yield. I'm doing the same thing here. By waiting, I'm giving up one year of protection. So the dividend yield is more to reflect the fact that by waiting, you will give up something. So it's a measure of what you lose by waiting. Got it. Okay. okay. And then the, the equivalency in terms of when it happens uh, hmm. is like a year of delay is equivalent to the opportunity cost of the dividend exactly. loss. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. That's exactly okay. it. Yeah. So now let's apply this. Darshan, you have a question? Um, so I was thinking whether the cost of delay starts from the point when the project becomes viable or from the point that you... I would just use it all the way through. It'll take care. The model will take care of itself because if your option is out of the money, Okay. then it's, there's nothing to trade off against, right? So there's always a cost to delay, but when the option is not viable, you don't care about it, right? Nobody's exercising early there. It's only when the option becomes viable that the trade-off even kicks in. So there's always a cost to delay, but whether it affects your optionality will be once your option turns in the money. So you don't have to make that judgment call. It takes a lot out of our hands. So I'm going to apply this on a drug called Avenex. And the reason I was able to do it, I, I was able, I was lucky enough to get my hands on the internal cash flows that Biogen, the company that owned the rights to Avenex had, produced at the time that this, this analysis was done. So this was in the late 90s. Avenex, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is a drug to treat MS. And it came out with huge hopes. Of, it's going to be a blockbuster drug. And Biogen then was a small biotech firm. So this was right after they got the patent and they had the patent for the next 17 years. So file that away. Biogen did an internal capital budgeting analysis on what they thought they would make if they developed Avenix right away. And based on their assessment of expected future cash flows and cost of capital, so traditional capital budgeting, the present value of the cash flows they thought they could get by developing the drug was 3,422 million or 3.4 billion. So that's just the present value of cash flows, traditional DCI. They estimated the cost of developing the drug commercially to them would be about 2.875 billion. Why? Because Biogen at that time had never fully developed and sold a drug on their own. They'd actually developed drugs and licensed them out. So they had no production facilities, no sales teams. So they estimated it would cost them 2.875 billion to put those into place. Let's say I stop right there. If this were a traditional capital budgeting analysis, the present value of the cash flows is 3,422 million and the initial investment is 2,875 million. What's the net present value of this project? It's going to be the difference between the two, right? Which is about 547 million. The NPV of this project is 547 million. It's just the difference between those two numbers. 
So if this were a traditional DCF, the value of this pattern is 547 million. Now we're going to have some fun. That is the net present value they develop right away. They have 17 years to play the game because they have exclusive protection. The riskless rate at that time for a 17 year, 20 year bond was about 6.7%. 6 for the variance in this present value, I cheated. You say, why don't you do a Monte Carlo simulation? I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not a pharmaceutical person. I can't project out cash flows. So what I did was I cheated by looking at the industry average variance in firm value of biotech firms. So it's like a bottom-up beta. I looked up a bottom-up variance, and that was 0.224, immense variability. And this drug is viable. By waiting one year, I'm going to give up one out of the remaining 17 years of protection. So the cost of delay is 5.89%. I've got S, K, T, R, Sigma, and Y. Basically, I've got the six inputs I need for the dividend yield adjusted black shorts. I plugged in N of D1, N of D2, and I get a value for the option of 907 million. You say, what the heck is that? Valued as an option, Avonex is worth 907 million. Remember what the net present value was? It was 547 million. You say, where's the extra 360 million value coming from? It's coming from the optionality. But there is actually a dark underbelly to what I've just done. Because what I've just said is if Avonex is developed by Biogen right now as a commercial drug, the value is only 547 million. By waiting and trying to get more information and trying to make this a more cash flow lucrative drug, I'm getting a value of 907 million. So if I were advising from a purely financial perspective, I were advising Biogen, I'd probably say, look, you've got a very valuable patent, but don't develop it right now. Wait and collect more information. Maybe you can reduce the side effect. Maybe you can see other uses and you get an extra 360 million. You see why you should be torn about giving this advice? I mean, if you have a relative or a friend or even an acquaintance with MS, I mean, you want the drug to be developed right away. And here you're telling Biogen, just wait, your financial payoff will be higher. Just to put your conscience at rest, Biogen actually developed Avonex almost immediately which means there's something in my analysis that I'm missing, which, you know, which is leading me to overvalue the option. So what do you think I am bringing in that is leading me to overvalue the option? Well, we can adjust the variance. So some of it could be technical. The variance has to adjust over time. What's my cost to delay? One over 17, right? What am I assuming? That Biogen is the only game in town and if they delay it, they have 16 more years of protection. But is that true? Is Biogen the only pharmaceutical company working on MS drug? I don't think so. What if I told you that Merck is working on its own version of an MS drug and um, they're four years away from commercial production? You know what's going to happen? My cost to delay instead of being 1 17th will be 1 4th. I really get only four years of protection. And if I make that 1 4th and the cost to delay is 25%, the value of this option will drop to 477 million. It will drop below the 547 million. So in practice, if I hold everything else constant, I'm not going to develop this drug for almost seven years because that's when the value of the option drops below. Because every year, if I hold the inputs constant, my cost of delay is going to increase, right? Because next year it's going to be 1 16th and 1 15th and 1 14th. There's going to be a tipping point. If Biogen were a monopoly pharmaceutical company, if it's the only pharmaceutical company in town, you're going to have to wait a long time for this new drug to come out. The more competitive the business, the quicker the drug is going to get developed because you're going to develop the drug almost immediately after the present net present value turns positive. You're not going to wait for the option value to decline there. Now, Sammy asks, why, you know, why would you consider delaying a drug which will gain you money? Because maybe you can gain even more money. Maybe there's an upside here to waiting. Because remember, when drugs hit the market, there are side effects and side costs, and perhaps you haven't done your research well enough. There's always more you can do, right? More, more you can do to finesse the drug, reduce the cost. So the upside might be limited, but there's upside from waiting. And as Sam points out, what's driving this is uncertainty. You're uncertain about the market. You're uncertain about the value. And the fact is, you don't know what the market will look like a year from now, two years from now. And that's what that's the key shift you get when you shift to options. Yeah. 
So I personally believe that in a, com in a comparative pharmaceutical market where com different companies are competing for drugs, the optionality in patents very quickly drops off. And that's why I'm more reluctant to apply this in pharmaceuticals now than I did when I first started. Because I've discovered that you know, by waiting, there's far less upside than I thought there was. And often there's a downside of somebody else develops the drug. Yeah, I'm losing value that I could have gained by developing the drug right away. Any, any questions on, on, that, on that example? Professor, uh, yep. so I missed in the, in the calculation, I missed where the, how you got the D1 and D2. Well, I used, basically I went and plugged back into this equation. Let's see, where's it do? See this equation here? So basically take this entire equation, plug in the S, K, R, T, Sigma, and Y. In fact, it's a good exercise. Try it out with a calculator and you should get the D1 and D2 that you see here. So basically it says plugging the numbers in the equation. I get D1 of D2, N of D1 and N of D2. So basically it's just going through the dividend yield adjust black shorts with all of those inputs fed in. Question now. Um, so those 900 million, yeah. does that tell you how long to wait? No, no, that tells you the value of not if you just treat it as an option. The 547 million is the value of develop, developing right away. That's why I said if Biogen asked me for pure financial advice based on that value, I'd tell them to wait. And then in this graph, I compute what will happen to the value each year and the value of developing. So each year you wait, the value of the option decreases. You have fewer years left, the cost of delay goes up, and there's going to be a point where the value of the option drops below the DCF value. In a pure financial world, that's when you develop the drugs. So that's why I said you've got to wait about seven plus years if this were a monopoly company for the drug to be developed. So the option value is the value of having the patent, the DCA value is what you would get if you developed today. Professor, um, um, hi everyone. Yes. Um, I still, can you go to the chart, the, the graph where it shows uh, the option over time? So yes, one. we're saying, the, um, yeah, this one. So we're saying that. So the, the, let's, go, way, let's do the easy line first. The purple line is the NPV. So if I hold everything else constant, the NPV is 547 million, right? That's just S minus K. Yeah, well, I'm looking at it from a financial slash a human side of things. Right. Um, are we saying that in an inhumane world, they would prefer to delay the... Absolutely. I mean, I'll give you an, I'll give you an example. Remember when Glaxo at Zantac, Zantac was the primary ulcer drug. It dominated 90% of the market, right? Let's say Glaxo Labs has come up with a new version of a drug, slightly better than, than Zantac, for treating ulcers, right? And it will cost them $3 billion to introduce the drug, but they're going to cannibalize their own product. You know what Glaxo is going to do? I mean, from a pure financial standpoint, the new ulcer drug might, if they were basically didn't have to worry about competition, the new ulcer drug is slightly better for patients, so they should introduce it, but they, from a financial perspective, it makes no sense. They're going to be cannibalizing their own product and the net present value of the project would be negative. So that's what I meant about if, you're, if you dominate a market or you're the only player in town, drugs are going to come out slower than if you're in a comparative pharmaceutical market. Because in a comparative market, the minute a drug becomes viable, you have an incentive to develop it. In a non-comparative market, you own the market already. Why would you care from a pure financial standpoint, that a new drug is better at treating a disease or slightly better at treating a disease than an older one because you have no incentive to introduce it. It's, I mean, it's the nature of competition and that's what's playing out here. So let's talk about using this to actually value a pharmaceutical company or a biotech company. You can actually value a biotech or a pharmaceutical company in three slices. The first is if it already has drugs out there that produce cash flows, you can value those drugs because they've already been developed using a DCF value. The patents you can value using options. And there's a third slice that's tricky. Remember there's an R&D department that still exists. That R&D department might churn out new patents in the future. 
So the third slice tells you what the value of that R&D continuum is going to be. And that's a tricky one because you don't know what patterns are going to, they're going to develop. So you've got to make some judgment calls on that third slice. Is my R&D value creating or value destroying? You see, what are you talking about? Remember when we capitalized R&D at Amgen you know, way back, you know, six ses 10 sessions ago? I talked about the reason we're doing this is we want to figure out whether R&D is value creating or destroying by looking at the return you make on R&D versus the cost of capital. You can do R&D and be value neutral if the value of what you create is equal to the cost. You can be value creating if your R&D earns a return capital of 20 or 25 percent. Or you can do R&D and destroy value as Merck was doing in the first decade of this century. So the first slice is easy. It's a DCF value. The second slice is tricky. It's option value. The third slice is even trickier because you're making judgments about future R&D. I tried this on Biogen. Biogen's existing products are actually very easy to value. They had two drugs. They'd licensed these drugs out to, I think one was, I think they were both licensed out to Upjohn or a Merck, you know, one of the larger pharmaceutical companies. And Biogen had a license fee of a $50 million, it was a guaranteed fee, $50 million every year for the next 12 years. The reason I emphasize the guaranteed fee is there are two ways you can license a drug. One is you can get a fixed amount every year and it's guaranteed by whoever buys the license from you, or you can get a share of the revenues. This was a guaranteed license fee of $50 million every year for the next 12 years. So I had to value that slice. So let me ask you a question. How would I value the present? Clearly, it's got to be a present value of 50 million over the next 12 years. That's the easy part. The question was what discount rate to use? I could discount the 50 million back at Biogen's cost of capital. I could discount it back at Biogen's cost of equity. Biogen's, you know what I discounted back at? I discounted it back at the pre-tax cost of debt of the guarantor. In this case, let's say it was Merck. I use Merck's pre-tax cost of debt as my discount rate to discount the 50 million back over the next 12 years. Why do you think I did that? Why am I using Merck's pre-tax cost of debt as my discount rate if these are the fees coming into Biogen from a drug that they've produced? So this like taking, buying a bond, bond issued by Merck with these payments? Okay. In other words, you're saying that the risk in these, what's the only risk I face in these cash flows? That Merck might go bankrupt, right? I mean, this is not a cost of equity. It's not a share of equity earnings. So clearly cost of equity and cost of capital don't kick in. It's got to be at the risk of the guarantor. So in this case, if Merck has a double A rating, I'm feeling pretty good about the 50 million. In fact, let's do a what if. What if the Biogen had licensed this out to Medicare? and Medicare were paying 50 million in cash flows every year for the next 12 years. Then what would I use as my discount rate? Alex, you said risk-free. Explain why it's risk-free. Because, uh, yeah, because uh, Medicare is backed by the federal government. Exactly. And, and, and. So, I think we spend so much time on cost of equity and capital, and I think we, and I blame us collectively in finance, that sometimes we want to bring out the big ammunition for discount rates, but if you have a guaranteed payment, the question you got to ask is, who's guaranteeing the payment and what's the risk in that guarantee? That's why I'm using the pre-tax cost of debt. The present value 50 million at 7%, which was the pre-tax cost of debt then, was 397.13 million. Why am I using the pre-tax cost of debt? Because the 50 million is a pre-tax license fee. If I did this in after-tax terms, I could use an after-tax cost of debt. It's probably simpler to just take the pre-tax license fee divided the pre-tax cost of debt. Any questions on... No. I'm sorry? If the... Um, oh, the 50 million... No, I'm sorry. The 50 million is an after-tax cash flows. The risk that I see is the risk in in Merck, that's why I use the 7%. So it's an after-tax cash flow, but I'm discounting back at the pre-tax cost of debt because the risk I see in the cash flows is that Merck will not deliver on those cash flows. My value would still be low, but I'm, it's not my cost of debt. It's Merck's cost of debt, so my tax rate, my tax benefits don't even kick in here. Could you, sorry, Professor, could you, um this is Jessica, explain yep. one more time about the why we're using it. If 
the license fees are in after-tax cash flow, why are we using pre-tax? I understand why we're using Mark's cost of debt, but why are we using pre-tax if it's an after-tax cash flow? Let, let, me, let me use the more extreme example. Let's say for sort of government warrior guarantor, right? So you have a risk-free yeah. rate as the discount rate. Would you use an after-tax risk? I mean, I'm not sure where the taxes would even kick in, right? Because you're asking, what's the risk in the cash flow? The seven person is a stand-in for the risk in the cash flow. It's not a cost of debt in the traditional sense of what we use in a cost of capital. We get a tax benefit. Biojet is not going to get a tax benefit on this seven percent because Merck is paying is paying the fifty million. Merck will get a tax benefit, but Biogen doesn't get the tax benefit. Do you see what I'm saying? What I'm saying, in this case, there is a tax benefit to the person making the payment on the other side. So Merck, when it does its calculation of what these costs are, can look at the tax benefit it gets from the payments. But Biogen doesn't get any tax benefit. So if I use an after-tax cost of debt, and I come to you and say, where's the tax benefit at Biogen? Biogen has no debt. I'd be understating my discount rate for a tax benefit I am not getting as Biogen. So the tax benefit we bring into a cost of debt when we do cost of capital reflects the fact that we are borrowing the money, we get interest expenses, we get a tax benefit from the debt. But in this case, Biogen is getting no tax benefit from the debt because it's not borrowing money in the first place. So I'm just using the 7% as a measure of how much risk there is in the cash flow. But Biogen gets no tax benefits from that payment. So if I use a, so basically if I push up my present value by using an after-tax cost of debt, I'm giving Biogen tax benefits from debt that they don't have in the first place. Thank you. Okay. Perry, did that make sense to you? Because I, the reason I'm using the pre-tax cost of debt is this has nothing to do with Biogen borrowing money and getting a tax benefit. It's Merck's, no, pre-tax cost of debt is a measure of the risk in the cash flows. But I get none of the benefits from debt that I would get if I were borrowing the money. Yeah. So now let's talk about the future R&D. And here I had to make some assumptions. So here's what I assume. First, I assumed that I could estimate what the R&D expenditures were going to be for the next 10 years. And to do that, I took the existing R&D expenses, grew them at 20% a year for the next 10 years. That's my assumption. You could have made a different assumption. And after year 10, I assumed a 5% growth forever. Why that high? Because remember, it's a different point in time. The risk-free rate was 55 to 6%. So 20% growth in the next 10 years, 5% thereafter. I also assumed that every dollar invested in research would create a dollar 25 in patents. So in effect, I'm assuming that at least for the next 10 years, R&D is value creating. You're saying, why a dollar 25? I actually looked at the return on capital for biotechnology companies collectively and the cost of capital. And basically, collectively, biotechnology companies were generating a return capital of about 3 to 4% above their cost of capital. And if you generate about 3 to 4% above your cost of capital, a dollar invested will translate into about $1.25 in additional value. Just do a net present value. What if I invest $10 and I make $13 as my cash flow? The present value is what you're capturing here. So it is an assumption that at least for the next 10 years, Biogen will continue to create value. And then I assumed after year 10, R&D would become a neutral asset. In other words, they would continue to do R&D, but they will earn a dollar in value for every dollar invested. You're saying, why would I want to do that if I'm just creating no net present value? Well, R&D departments are tough to disband and send away. I did assume that there's a substantial amount of risk in this slice of the data. So I used the cost of capital of young startups, basically, in this business. And the young startups, the cost of capital is closer to 15%. So the third slice, here's what I did. I first estimated the R&D cost. That's 100 million growing at 20% a year. You multiply the R&D cost by $1.25. That's my judgment call. I'm creating the value. So in year one, for instance, 120 million in R&D creates 150 million in value. The difference is the value created. I discount that back one year at 15%. Year two, my R&D is 144 million times 1.25 gives me 180 million. Excess value is 36, discounted back two years, 27.22. And I do this for the next 10. You see what happens after year 10? Remember after year 10, I earn my cost of capital, so the excess value created is zero, so I can ignore everything that happens after year 10. My present value of R&D is $318 million. I've got all three slices. 
my existing products are worth 397 million. That's a 50 million discounted back at Merck's cost of debt, pre-tax cost of debt. 907 million is the value of Avenex as an option. The 318 million is the value of future R&D based upon my judgment calls in the previous page. The sum of those three values becomes the value of the operating assets. You know how when we discount free cash for the firm at the cost of capital, we get a value for the operating assets? This is another way you can get a value for an operating assets for a pharmaceutical company is by breaking it up into three slices. I'll also tell you, I would never in my lifetime do this for a Merck or an Upjohn or Pfizer or an Amgen. You know why? The existing patents, I might have to value a hundred different patents. There is no way I'm doing this if you're a big pharmaceutical company. If you're a young startup with one big blockbuster drug, either already patented or working its way through the pipe pipeline, then it makes sense to do this. But don't double count because if you do this, don't count in the growth in your cash flows because that growth is going to come from developing your patents and you're counting the value of the patents as an option. So in this case, all I had to do because I had no debt and very little cash outstanding was I took the 1,622 and divided by the number of shares outstanding to get a value per share. So let's review. I valued the one big patent, Biogenet Avenix, as an option. I then valued the existing drugs that they'd licensed out. These were the commercial drugs as a present value of 50 million for the next 12 years using the pre-tax cost of debt because these were guaranteed payments. In fact, just as a what if, what if Biogen's agreement was not that the payment would be guaranteed, but it's a percentage of revenues or operating income. Then would I use a different discount rate, do you think? Would you use the equity, cost of equity for work? Yeah, I would, or, or the cost of equity for biotech companies collectively, right? Because in a sense, you know, Biogen might be too small, it's, um, it, you know, it's, it's basically, I would use a cost of equity because it would be a, a payment out of equity income. And I, because my share of that equity income gives me the risk of equity, I would use a cost of equity. Whether we, we would use Merck's cost of equity or biotech cost of equity will depend on whether you think pharmaceutical companies have different cash flows than biotech companies. But I would use a cost of equity then. In fact, there are a few problems from prior quizzes where this becomes the fulcrum. What discount rate should you use to value this slice? Always go back to the risk in the cash flow. And that'll give you a sense of, you know, you know what should I be using as my discount rate? Any questions about, uh, about the Biogen example? So let's put this to the test, right? Is there an option? Yes. What's the underlying asset? It's a product that comes out of the patent. The contingency is if the present value of the cash flows from developing the patent exceed the cost, you will develop. If not, you won't. Is there exclusivity? Well, I think so, at least in the US. The reason I say that is there are some countries, and I won't name them, where you can get a patent. You, get, you think you have the exclusive right to do something, but people violate your patent all the time. There's not much you can do about it. But to the extent that patents give you exclusivity, there is, it passes the exclusivity test. But I'll tell you where you have the trickiest time is putting the pricing test. Because for option pricing to work, remember what has to be true. You have to be able to trade the underlying asset. You have to be able to trade the option. And you have to know what the cost of exercise in the option is. In the case of a patent, patents are not traded. Once in a while, you might see a whole portfolio of patents being sold. I remember, I think Qualcomm sold like 700 patents to somebody for a lump sum. But patents are not, you can't go on Bloomberg and say, what's the value? No, give me the traded price in the patent. So patents are not sold. The product that comes out of the patent is definitely not traded. And it's very difficult to get past that fuzziness. So what I would say is that 907 million you saw as the value of the patent, take it with a grain of salt, maybe a whole pitcher of salt. Because I can use an option pricing model, but I'm kind of pushing the model to its natural limits and beyond. Okay. So that's valuing a patent as an option. Let's move to a second example of an option to delay. But before I do that though, I mean this valuing patent as an option is, even if you never apply an option pricing model, that's recognizing that there's a value to non-viable patent is a big step in the right direction because I've seen companies give away patents which they think are not viable today for nothing and then regret it five, seven, ten years later when things change underneath. So there are no questions. Let's move on to a second example. 
Let's suppose you're a natural resource company and you have an undeveloped reserve. You know, you know let's say a geologist or whoever you hire tells you there's 100 million barrels of oil under the ground there. If you develop the reserve today, let's suppose you can make V, whatever that amount is, 100 million barrels, you know, times the oil price, net of the cost. And let's say the cost of develop, developing this, this reserve is X. Again, here's what it looks like. If V is greater than X, you will develop the reserve today and claim the difference. If V is less than X, you'll do nothing. You would, you'll just wait. Wait for something good to happen. In this case, the oil price will go up. Let's see what the payoff diagram looks like. The cost of de developing the reserve becomes the equivalent of the strike price. You will develop the reserve if the value of the oil under the ground exceeds that cost. And of course, that might never happen. In which case, what have you lost? How did you get these reserves in the first place? Just as with patents, you have exploration costs that becomes the price you pay to get these reserves or you bought the reserves from somebody. You bid at a government auction. That becomes the cost. You know how many oil companies around the world are sitting on reserves now? They say, what, did I, what was I thinking when I bought these reserves? It's too late now. But in a sense, the cost is what you pay to get these reserves. And if the value of oil never goes above the cost, you're going to end up just writing off those reserves. Is there an option? Clearly. What's the underlying asset? The oil under the ground. So let's think about putting some flesh on this example by looking at how we'd estimate the numbers. You can already start to see the pattern I'm going to follow, right? When I take a real option, first I'm going to identify the option by drawing the payoff diagram. Next, I'm going to try to figure out ways of getting S, K, R, T, and Sigma because if I can get that, I can use the pricing model. So let's see how we'd get the inputs to an option pricing model. First, we need to know what the value of reserves is that you have, right? How do you get that? Well, you call the geologist and the geologist says, look, you know, you're 100 million barrels of oil under the ground. And then you say, well, if I develop this reserve today, and that's a key, you have to think about developing it today. What would the present value of the cash flows be from developing the reserve? So that becomes the S. The cost of developing this reserve, this reserve depends on where the reserves are. If they're in the middle of uh, Saudi Arabia, the cost of de developing the reserve might be relatively small. But if they're in the, 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 the north of Canada and they're frozen, they're 5,000 feet under the ground, they might be much larger. So the cost of developing the reserve is the cost of putting the rig or whatever else you need to put in to get the oil out of the ground. So you have some history of having done this in the past. You can tell me what it will cost you. So the value of the available reserves have the cost of developing the reserve. The life of this option is however long you have the rights to develop this reserve. Most oil companies don't get the rights to develop their reserves in perpetuity. The way they get these rights is they go to the, Fed, the US government or the Canadian government, they bid for the rights to these reserves and they get the rights for 15 years, 20 years, 25 years. That becomes the life of the option. Sometimes you might not be able to get this life easily, in which case, think of how many barrels of oil there are under the ground in the reserve and how much you can extract per year. So let's say you have 100 million barrels of oil and you can extract 5 million barrels a year because that's what the natural limits to the technology are. You have about 20 years. So you can use that as the life of the option. What about the variance in the value? This is the easiest of the real options to value because to the extent that the geologist's estimate is right, there are 100 million barrels of oil. The only thing that causes the value of the oil to change from year to year is the oil price, right? And now you see why this option is easier to value than most other real options. Oil is a traded commodity. I can look at the history. I can go to Bloomberg and look up a variance in oil prices. That becomes the variance in the value. Now, once your reserve becomes viable, again, I've got to introduce a cost of not developing the reserve. Because let's face it, here there's a definite upside, right? Let's say you have reserves as Exxon right now with a cost of $30 a barrel of developing the reserve. The oil price goes to 32. Technically, you're already in the money, right? You should develop the reserve. But part of you is saying, but let's wait. Maybe oil prices can go to 60 or $80 a barrel. There's an upside to waiting. So the cost of not developing the reserve, once it becomes viable, is the cash flows you'd have got if you develop the reserve. So by sitting on the reserve, you give up those cash flows. I'm going to treat that as the equivalent of the dividend yield. And you're going to see this in real option after real option. I will introduce a cost to waiting because if I don't, 
you will just sit on this reserve to the very last day. You have the rights to it, and then you'll try to get the oil out. And how much oil can you get out in one day? And finally, with natural resource reserves, there is a development lag. Let me explain. Let's assume, for whatever reason, oil prices go to $80 next week. ExxonMobil notices. So somebody at ExxonMobil headquarters picks up the phone and says, let's develop the reserves right away, $80 per barrel price, we can develop the reserves. Oil doesn't come out of the ground the next day, right? To develop these reserves, people have to put rigs in, you know, the, the process takes time. And let's assume it takes you two years to develop these reserves. There are two things you worry about. Remember what triggered your choice to develop these reserves was the fact that oil prices hit $80 a barrel. And if it takes you two years to get the oil out of the ground, by the time the oil actually comes out of the ground, the oil price might be down to 40. You can protect partially against that problem by going out to the forward market. But one of the things you worry about is the oil price could change. The other is a simple present value problem. For those two years, while you're developing the reserves, you don't get cash flows. So even though the oil is worth more than, than what the costs are, the value of the oil is greater, you gotta wait for those two years to get the oil out. So I'm gonna to try to apply this approach to value and developed reserves. And I'm gonna go back again to a very old example. It's a company called Gulf Oil. This was early in the 1980s. It was targeted in a hostile acquisition. It was targeted because it had lots of undeveloped reserves. It had 3,038 million barrels of oil that it had in undeveloped reserves. And the estimated cost then was it cost about $10 a barrel to develop all of these reserves. So just as a static analysis, if they decided to develop all the reserves immediately, it will cost them 3,038 times 10, which is $30.38 billion. That's how much they had in undeveloped reserves. Then an average life on these reserves of about 12 years. You say, what do you mean? Well, some of these reserves, they had five years left, some 15, some 20. The average life across, because these were multiple reserves in different parts of the world. The average life was 12 years. The price per barrel of oil, when I did this analysis, was $22.38 per barrel. This was almost 36 years ago. So it's amazing that we're 36 years later, we're talking about oil prices being less than 22.38, but it's 22.38 a barrel. And the variable cost of production was about $7 per barrel in these reserves. So basically, if they develop these reserves today, they will take 3,038 million barrels of oil, they would sell, sell that oil for 22.38, but the variable cost is $7. So they make roughly 15.38 per barrel. The T-bond rate, when I did this, was 9%. Different time, different setting. And here's the final two pieces. They, there's, a, the, there's a development lag of about two years. It'll take about two years to develop these reserves. They choose to develop them. And once they start developing, the, de once they develop these reserves, the cash flows they will get from these reserves are going to be roughly 5% of that. So file that away because if they sit on these reserves, that's what they're giving up is those cash flows. They will make each other their way. To top off the whole analysis, oil price are variable. I shouldn't be, even have to say that after the last few weeks. The variance in oil prices at the time that I did this analysis was 0.03. I have everything I need. Let me try to value these undeveloped reserves as options. If I develop these reserves today, 3,038 million barrels times $15.38 per, per barrel. I, and remember, I don't get the oil for the first two years. So this looks like discounting, but in effect, what I'm doing is taking out the first two years of cash flows. Remember, I get 5% of value. I'm saying I won't get that for the first two years. My value of the oil reserves, developed reserves, is about 42.38 billion. The exercise price, is if I develop the reserves, is 30.38 billion. Again, let me pause right there. If I, div if I compare those two numbers, the difference is about, is about $12 billion. That's my DCF value for these undeveloped reserves. File that away just like we did, the 547 million for the pack. I now know my DCF value is about $12 billion. But I have an option. I can wait over the next 12 years for oil prices to go up. The variance in oil prices is 0.03 and the cost to delay is 5%. I plug the numbers in, D1, D2, N of D1, N of D2, going back to that Black-Scholes model with the dividend yield adjustment. I value the reserves as an option at $13.3 billion. 
I know there's a whole conversation going on in the chat. I'll come back and address it. But basically, here's what I have. My DCF value is 12 billion for the undeveloped reserves. My option value for these same undeveloped reserves is 13.3 billion. Remind me again where that extra 1.3 billion in value is coming from. It's coming from what's causing that extra 1.3 billion. Optionality. The option and where's but where is the optionality coming from? What aspect of these reserves creates the optionality? Of which which of these inputs is creating the optionality? The variance. If in fact, if I made the variance in oil prices zero, you know what would happen to the value of the option? It'll go to the DCF. Exactly. The more volatile oil prices become, the greater the optionality. Let me ask you a question. If you took a typical oil company today, Conoco, Exxon, Mobil, much of its undeveloped reserves today, are they going to be in the money or out of the money? Out of the money. So if I value them on a DCF basis, what am I going to conclude? These options are worth nothing, which would be a terrible mistake because these options are non -vi not viable today, but that doesn't mean that the rights to these options, no, the rights to these reserves is not worth any money. When you value oil companies or any natural resource companies, you have to look at the level of the price of the commodity, but you also have to look at the variance. The level is a big factor, but the variance will also determine how much optionality will still preserve, will still be left in your undeveloped reserves. So I think it's the, so it's, that's what I mean about even if you never use an option pricing model, the value of real option, the kind of insights you can get into why companies with undeveloped reserves can still be worth money when oil prices go to 18 or $20 a barrel. It's the optionality that's left in there. So there's a whole conversation um, that about development lags and, uh, and whether there should be a development lag for the patent as well, maybe there should be. I did not introduce a development lag, but maybe I should have even there. And you'd use the same process that I used for the undeveloped, for these reserves, I'm sorry, where I took out the 5% for the first two years, I'd use the exact same process with the development lag with patents as well. So if you feel, take your time to go from exercise to actually getting cash flows, the best way to reflect that is to reduce your S by that waiting period. And that's effectively what I'm doing. Any questions? A few quick questions. Yeah. Could you just ex could you just explain the dividend yield here? That's one year of net production revenue. Exactly. It's a so think of it as yeah. It's exa that's exactly what it is. It's basically the cash flow you're leaving on the table for the next year by not develop. So it's a one year cost. So if I ask you, what do you lose by waiting an extra year? What you're losing here is the cash flows you could have collected, and that cash flow would have been 5% of the value of the reserves. It just happens to be 5% based on these random numbers. Basically, so no, in a no, real no, analysis, no. you know what, exactly, you know what I would do? I would actually take your cash flow in year one. Because remember, we did a projection of what you would make as cash flows. I, I'm taking the cash flow in year one and said, look, I'm giving up that cash flow because I can't do it. No. So it's, <clears throat> I use the 5%, but if you had an actual projection of cash flows on your oil reserve, I would take the cash flows in your one and say, that's what I'm giving up by not developing the reserves today. That's like a dividend yield. Okay. And then other question, and I don't know if it's explainable using yeah. black shoals, but what we just saw with oil prices going negative, is that explainable no, that, simply yeah. using black fact, shoals? I would it, expect... Yeah, it's not oil prices that went negative. It's oil futures in the near term. So, so we got to separate the two. You're saying, why would oil futures in the near term go negative? Because if you bought the oil today to deliver a month from now, right now you face a big problem. The problem is there's no storage. So people producing oil now have an issue, which is at least for the next month or two, that oil has no place to go. So you know what they're doing, right? They're paying people to take the oil off their hands saying, look, you know, I know you have no storage, but we can't have the oil either. So it's the storage problem that drove oil prices negative. So it's uh, less to do with optionality and more to do with futures and having to deliver the oil a month from now. And where do you store the oil for the next month if every storage capacity is already at full capacity?
Okay, so it would not be an appropriate parallel to say that the option to uh, buy and store the oil went below zero. It's a no, difference. it's a it's a futures contract rather than an option contract. That's why the futures contract went to below zero because in a futures contract you have to deliver the oil a month from now, Got it. and you have no place right. to store it. Okay. Yeah. Um, I yep. have one more question. Um, so for the variance of oil prices, are you looking at, like what period are you looking at? Are you looking at the 12 year period, which is your development period entirely, or what kind of yeah. period are you looking at? There are two variance? things. One is, you know, you're asking me how far back am I going, or are you looking at what, you know, what the, this is supposed to be the variance over the life of the option. And that's the other weakness with applying option pricing with these real options. Is traditional option pricing model, the variance doesn't change over the life of the option. Not a big deal if you have a three month option, but here you have an option for, for, for 12 years. That's, I think, one of the weaknesses in option pricing is the variance can't change over the life of the option. And in this case, you might argue that maybe the variance could change. So if you are going to use a variance, try to use a normalized variance. You don't want to use the variance in the last month if you're valuing an oil option for, for a 10 year option. It's really the variance over the next 10 years. Okay. So it's got to be a... Basically, variance over the life of the asset. Right? Exactly. It's got to be a very long-term variance where you feel pretty comfortable leaving it that number for the next 12 years. Thanks. Right. Professor, uh, is it not... Yes, go ahead. Uh, uh, okay, thanks. Uh, the variance is... I don't know if it's just me, but it seems quite low. It's it's, it's more because var variance is percentage square. Let, let me explain. Now, let's say you have a standard deviation of 20%. What's a variance? It's an easy one. 20% squared is 400%, right? But if I write it in decimal form, standard deviation of 20% is 0.2, right? What's 0.2 yeah. squared? Okay. It'll be 0 0.04. Uh, Variances in decimal uh, form always look low because they're in decimal form. So a 3% variance is like a 300% squared. So basically that's why it looks low because I've given it to you as a variance number. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank so uh, based on the variance question, yeah. um, so variance is based on a certain period of time, right? So what is the period of time? This is over the next 12 years. This is actually the same question Darshan asked, which is when you do an option pricing model, you're assuming that this is the variance for the entire life of the option. In this case, the option is 12 years. This is my expected oil price variance for the next 12 years. Okay. And um, I, I got lost where, where do we add the two years? Time well, the, the two years basically I take out of the value. I'm saying my value is lower because I have to wait two years to get to the oil. So the only place it shows up is when I do the value of the oil under the ground. If there wasn't a waiting period, this would be about 44 billion. Because I have to wait two years and I have to give up two years of cash flows, the value of the oil that I get in present value terms is lower. So that's the only place it shows up, is it makes my, my, my reserves less valuable because I have to wait to get to them. Okay, thanks. Chad? For the start, yep. I have one more question on the, on the variance. Um, since you're setting the variance for the entire time frame of the option, mm -hmm. um, is there a way that you could do like a Monte Carlo with some distribution around the variance itself? Oh, like how much that could possibly vary and see how that impacts the option value? The variance and the variance, <laughs> you could. Yeah. You could do Monte Carlo simulations on option pricing models. And you're right, there are two numbers that you're uncertain about. But the number that I'm more uncertain about than the variance is the value itself. And the option pricing model already captures that uncertainty of value. So I'm not sure what you would get out of it, I'll be quite honest, because it's a derivative asset. Now, ultimately, the, the number you should really make a bet on is where oil prices are going. So I'm not sure I want to do that. I could do it, but I'm not sure what I would do with it. That's what I'm, that's what I'm trying to say. I would get a value of the option then. Yeah, go ahead, Julieta. Um, 
um, going back to the uh, pattern case, you said yep. that the underlying asset was not traded, so does that reduce somehow the value of the, of the option? It just means that you can't monetize the option as easily. Normally when you have an option, you can monetize it by creating that synthetic, you know, the replicating portfolio. That 907 million is a value, but if you try to sell it to somebody else and they offered you only 650 million, don't walk away very quickly from the table saying it's worth 907 million. It's not easy to convert the 907 million into real value. So what it effectively means is you can put a number using an option pricing model, but you might not be able to sell it at that number because it's not easily monetized. Oh, gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. So let me complete my, go ahead Alex. Yep. Sorry, uh, so last question. I think like on the, uh, on the pharmaceutical example, you used your strike price and like the uh, mm -hmm. share price using like the present value of like the cash flow. Why are we not doing this? Then? You could do the same thing. I just use a shortcut. You could take all the oil, you could take the amount of oil you produce every year. So the question that Alex is asking is, why did I take the shortcut? Because I was lazy. I could take the 3,038 million barrels since I'm going to produce 303.8 million barrels every year for the next 10 years, project out. And remember, you're projecting out based on the current price. It'll be the futures price in one year, two years, three years. Get the expected cash flows every year, discount it back, and come up with the NAS. So I, I have absolutely no problems with doing that. I was just being lazy here. Because if you don't have a view on oil prices, roughly speaking, in present value terms, this is what it work out to. But you know, you can do the full fledged cash flows in present value, just like you did in the previous example. And there, Chad's suggestion would actually make sense: is do a Monte Carlo simulation and come up. With, so, if you want to bring in a Monte Carlo simulation, it'll be in the present value calculation. So let's complete this process. Here's what I did. I just like with Biogen, I said I valued the undeveloped reserves. Let me value the developed reserves. And they had about, you know, the substantial amount of developed reserves that were producing about $915 million in cash flows in the most recent year. And they had enough oil in those developed reserves to keep doing that for the next 10 years. So here's what I did. I took the $915 million. I'm going to get it for the next 10 years, so that's the present value. If this equation looks a little unfamiliar, that's just the present value of an annuity of 915 million. And I used the costed capital for Gulf Oil to discount these cash flows. So my DCF part, I'm staying with what's true and what the, the, the tried and true, basically taking cash flows, discounting back at the cost of capital. I get 5,066 million. I add that to the value of the undeveloped reserves, I get a value the firm, the operating assets of 18.4 billion. I subtract out the debt, I get a value for the equity. My value per share debt. So once I get my value of 18.3 billion, the rest of the process looks just like it did in DCF. Add cash, subtract debt, do options, subtract those out as well. But the key here is I'm building up to the value of my operating assets by valuing the company in two pieces. Developed reserves as a DCF, the undeveloped reserves as options. Any questions on? So what I'd like to do is at least start on the option to expand because this is the option that excites people. It's what we often talk about, as I said, when we talk about strategic considerations or I'm going to do this because I think it's going to be, give me a chance to do other things in the future. So here's how it works. For the I option... Have one quick yeah. question on the last section before you sure. begin. Yeah. Can, can you explain again, the exclusivity um, provision as it relates to these businesses. That's good. Like, That's a good. Get it? Like yeah. without exclusivity, the option doesn't have exactly. that because it's So where does the exclusivity come from for natural resource companies? The, your rights over the reserve? No, go back even further, right? There's only so much oil under the ground. There's only so much gold under the ground. For natural resource companies, the exclusivity comes from nature, which is you can't decide. So let's suppose the oil demand you know, goes up tenfold. You can't say, okay, well, let's create 10 times more oil. The problem though that you can point out to is there might be only so much oil under the ground, but I can get energy from the sun, from... You know. So I think with oil companies, one of the things that's happened over the last 10 years that shaken their exclusivity is the fact that other forms of energy 
are being offered as alternatives. They might not be big enough and substantial enough to make up for oil completely, but the exclusively natural resource companies comes from the fact that they have, it comes from nature. So that's where the exclusive, so if oil prices go to $250 a barrel, you and I can't go in our backyard and dig and say, I'm gonna look for oil. We could, but we're not gonna hit oil. So the exclusivity comes from a natural restriction. It's the reason, in fact, why real estate in New York has an option value and real estate in Las Vegas does not. And, the, and okay, so that makes sense to me. And the, the place that you see that in the math is in the price of the underlying asset because it can never go to zero because of the scarcity of the asset. Or in the actual use of an option pricing model. For instance, if you ask me what the value of the option added in real estate in Kansas City is, it's basically that there's no restriction. I can have, the people can keep building real estate or, or in Vegas, they can keep building you know more houses further and further away from the city. The natural right. exclusivity in, so I wouldn't even use an option pricing model in a case where there's no exclusivity. It's a fact that I have exclusivity that allows me to play the game. So I and only I can develop this over the next 12 years. Collectively, right. you're making that assumption about all oil companies. So it's it the very fact that I'm using an option pricing model means I've already decided that there's exclusivity. And when I test it, that's really where you gotta push me, right? Is you do you truly have exclusivity? No. Okay, Is so there a limit to the upside? The property of exclusivity does not ex explicitly appear anywhere in no. the math of Black Shoals because no. you wouldn't use Black Shoals if there exactly. wasn't exclusivity. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So the option to expand basically means, it, 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 to understand the option to expand, you've got to recognize it, it, it requires two projects to be bound together. The first project is a negative net present value project. So there's no debate about that. But that negative net present value project gives you the rights to a second project, which right now also has a negative net present value. You see, this is terrible. You want me to do a bad project to get a right to a second project that's also bad? Yes, because here's what, here's the saving grace. On the second project, you get the right to take that project. The investment you will have to make on that expansion becomes the equivalent of the strike price. The value of the cash flows you would get from expanding becomes the equivalent of the S in the model. If the present value of the cash flows from expanding exceed the cost of expanding, you'll expand and make money. But if, you, if, you, if that never happens, and it might never happen, what do you lose? Remember the first project had a negative net present value and you took it? That becomes the cost of this option. I know it sounds incredibly abstract, but I'm going to end today's session with a very simple example of how this would play out in a discounted cash flow valuation. Let's say I value a small software company. I'm going to give it a name, SecureMail. It produces antivirus software. And I estimate a value of 115 million on a DCF basis. Expected cash flows discounted back at a cost of capital. So if I stop with the DCF, that's the most you would pay for the company. And I say, wait, there is this added advantage you're getting with this company. When they sell their antivirus software to, to, to their customers, they get a customer base that they will, that's a pretty proprietary base that they will build up over time. And it's a database. And any time over the next five years, they can create a database software program based on the information they're collecting on their customers. It's all in the future, it's all fuzzy. But I'll tell you what it'll cost SecureMail today to develop this new database program. It'll cost them about a half a billion. And if they develop the program today, they can expect to make about $40 million in after-tax cash flows every year for the next 10 years. If I pause right there, you're saying, that's a terrible investment. You want me to invest a half a billion and make 40 million a year for the next 10 years? Even before discounting, I'm getting only 400 million. And if I add in the risk in that, there's a 12% cost of capital. But here's the saving rates, and this is what makes options so messy. I'm very uncertain about the future. There's a standard deviation in this value. The, remember the 40 million, there's a, there's a big uncertainty about that number. Let's say the standard deviation is 50% in that number. And let's say that the five-year risk-free rate is 3%. So the 115 million is the DCF, but I'm throwing in this extra factor, which is they're building a platform and a user base that they might be able to use for something in the future. Right now, I can't think of what it is. It's not worth money, but it could be worth money in the future. So here's what I did. I valued that option. So it's that second investment I can make as 
an option. So present value 40 million at 12% for 10 years is 226 million. The cost of entering that market is a half a billion. So already you can see this is a deep part of the money option. I have five years during which I can exercise this right and a 50% standard deviation. With a riskless rate of 3%, the value that I get for this option is 56 million. You see, what does that even mean? The value of the platform they built in terms of optionality is about 56 million. If you ask me how much should I pay for this company, I would take the 115 million and add the 56 million on top. The value of the expansion option gives me a value of 171 million. I have never actually explicitly done this when I value a company, but it's entered my decision making. And I'll, and I'll explain what I mean by this. So remember about two and a half years ago when Facebook... No? I'm sorry, what? Where did the what come from? Which... I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Which... What, where did the what come from? The 115? 115, yeah. Oh, that was my original DCF value. So basically, it was just free cash flow of the firm discounted back at the cost of capital. So it's a traditional DCF value. This is just the option on top of it. So as I said, let me give you the, the place where it played out. So remember about two years ago when Facebook had that um, Cambridge Analytica scandal and the stock price dropped like 130 and people were convinced that this was the end? I actually did a valuation of Facebook then. I came up with a value about 140. Not much margin for safety, right? Value is 140, stocks at 130. I bought Facebook and the reason I bought it with that very small margin of safety is I valued Facebook entirely as an online advertising company because that's where it gets its revenues and that's where I expect it to get its revenues in the near term and perhaps even in the medium term. But there is an optionality. And what's your optionality with Facebook? They have 2 billion users. Right now they sell them online advertising, but those users are on the Facebook ecosystem about an hour every day. Facebook could potentially think of other things to do. They might not have thought about it yet. It's like secure mail. Right now, it might not be viable. But to argue that it will never be viable is, I think, a mistake. There is an option added there, which means that my $140 discounted cash flow value will have a premium on top of it. So even if you never use the option pricing model to actually value the option to expand, it can come into play into whether you buy shares in Beyond Meat or in Zoom, because there is an optionality in these companies because they're building up a platform, maybe less so for Beyond Meat than for Zoom, which potentially could give them added value. So traditional DCF value then will understate the value of the company. So as you think about recommendations to make on your companies, especially if you're valuing one of these companies with platforms, Snap, it could be Zoom, it could be Facebook. Now think about what the value of that platform is as an option. You don't have to put the numbers in, but it'll add a premium to your DCF value and perhaps tilt you from a hold to a buy on some of these companies. Any final question that, um, any questions you want to ask before we sign off? Yeah, I yes. have one question. Yeah. Um, so is the 115 million including the net and uh, negative NPV of the... No, because, because remember, it's an option. Right. So right now, if you ask me, what is my expected path? I'm saying I'm, I would develop the software. So when I did the 115 million, I said it doesn't make sense to develop this database. So I'm not going to bring it into my DCF because it's not sensible. And I value the DCF. So in my DCF, I'm not building in a database software program because right now it doesn't make sense based on what I know about it. What changes, what creates your option is not that I think the database program will be worth money in the future, but because there's uncertainty in the business. So right now, the 115 million is just my traditional business and my traditional cash flows discounted back at a cost of capital that reflects that risk. So then, couldn't any company in this uh, space, like any company... Argue for a premium? And, and, they all, and they all do. So when you see all these tech companies claiming their platform as a value, they're all using this argument, right? So you see this with Spotify, you see this with Netflix. The question you're going to ask is the exclusivity question. So in the case of Secure Mail, if I were devil's advocate, I would ask them, are you the only person collecting this data? What are you finding out about your users that's going to give you this database advantage? So you're right. Companies will use this argument and tech companies do all the time. And the questions we have to ask are about, you know, what is it in this database? It's a, it's a question of big data. Now, 
I've said, you know, what I've said about big data is if everybody has it, nobody has it. So when somebody says, well, I have big data, when, when I remember when MoviePass claimed that they had big data because they were collecting, and my point was big deal. You know where I am, which movies I saw? What's the value in that? When Amazon and Netflix talk about big data, they're talking about optionality. So sometimes the argument makes sense, but a lot of times it flounders and falls apart because you have no exclusivity. Your platform is not giving you any special advantages. What if you have Shopify and you know people's shopping habits and now yeah. you've launched I think Shopify out. is a reasonable case to make. The question is, you know, you got to assess how much additional information that Shopify know about its customers than other online retail. Because remember, it's exclusivity, right? You're collecting information, but so is eBay, so is Amazon. So the question you got to ask is, what is Shopify learning about its customers that is unique? That's key. Because if it's not learning anything that's unique, I'm very quickly going to dilute the value of this option. How, how do you prove that it's unique? You can't prove it. You've got to ask questions. What are you learning about your customers? They say, well, we're learning locate. That, with MoviePass, that's how I found out. I asked the, 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 the finance people when they claimed that they were finding. I said, what are you finding out? I said, we know the location. I said, really? You and 26 other apps on my phone know it. They said, we know what movie you saw. I said, what are you going to do about it? They said, we're going to show you restaurants around the movie. I said, you and 15 other apps can do it. There's nothing exclusive. I'll tell you what Shopify, Shopify's real information advantage is less from the customer side, uh, you know, but and, and more about infrastructure that you're seeing built up. I, for Etsy, for instance, is accumulating information, not just from its customers, but from the people who sell products on Etsy. That is pretty unique information. And maybe they can use that in ways that other people who don't have that information couldn't really do things with. So it's, you're looking for something that's unique. Yeah. That, that's the model, as I understand, behind the mobile app, which is now using that information to... Yeah. And I think that, so I think that, and I think as long as they can show me it's unique and it's, it's, it has to be unique and it has to be actionable. Netflix is able to use big data well because it gets big data that's unique. It knows everything I've watched and it's actionable because it makes content based on what it learns from its users. That is useful, valuable data. Any other questions? Okay, we've run way over, so I'm sorry I ran a little bit over, but uh, thank you very much, and I will see you on Monday. But you'll hear from me, because I'll keep nagging you now that the, 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 the class is... Yep. Oh, yeah, I got one if you got an extra minute. Go so the re reason that we're not, we're not using uh, a cost of time or dividend yield here is because we don't... But this is like a project this, option, yeah. so we don't... There's nothing you're losing by waiting, right? So there's no cost of delay here. It's not a viable option. It's not like by waiting a year, you're losing anything. So in this case, there is really no cost to delay. You should wait as long as you can to develop this database. You know? So sometimes there's no cost to waiting. Sometimes there's a cost to waiting. The cost to waiting will lead you to, to, to exercise early, but if there's no reason to exercise early, might as well collect more information and do it at the very last moment. Yeah. And then in the beginning of class, uh, you said that the simple option value formula, it's really for input variables, S, K, R, T, but you also need to have some guess as to the volatility or standard deviation of the asset in every instance. It, absolutely. So Without a so sigma, the optionality goes away, right? It built, right. It's built entirely on that sigma, so you need that sigma. Got it. Keenan? <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. So, oh, that was you asking the question? <laughs> There are two mics open, Sam and Keenan. I don't know who asked me the question. Okay. Okay. I think I'm done now. Thank okay. you. Good. So that's it. Thank you, folks. And I will see you on Monday. But as I said, I'll nag you all through the weekend because we have only a week and a half left in the class. And I'm going to drag you across the finish line, even if it's the last thing I do. Bye. Bye. Yeah.